Hello sailors, it's the 22nd of September 2022, Thursday, and uh, at least in my time zone, the equinox occurs today, this evening. Um, things to talk about this time as you go through um, general topics, practice, and the Port Townsend, Washington uh, Wooden Boat Festival that I went to, and specifically to the Paradox. Um, bulkhead number two, just was going to recap a little bit what I did with drilling the drain hole there as well as the uh, transom, talking a little bit about uh, the, uh, the baffle and the cleat at the back for you know, keeping water out with the tiller, um, with the tiller hole there, and the odyssey uh, to getting that uh, working. Uh, so to start off with practice, practice has been kind of the theme for the summer for me. I'm someone who likes to be prepared, that good old you know, Boy Scout bit. Um, you know, read books and go into something thinking that I'm all ready for it. Um, but the reality is skills take practice to develop, no matter how much you read or how much you try to prep yourself, you know, intellectually for it. You have to get your hand on the tiller, hand on the sheet, or hand on the tools um, for woodworking. Um, I get frustrated sometimes because I see people building fantastic boats who are skilled woodworkers and I did build a boat in college years ago. Um, a decent boat, but it is very basic construction, and I don't do a lot of woodworking in between. And uh, you have to suck before you're good at something. Um, and so some of that frustration I have to temper with the reality that you know, the act of actually building things is what gives you the practice to do better. You know, I have some people who've showed um, good resources for working with epoxy, which is sometimes annoying. Uh, Don Elliott's guide for building the paradox has some guides in there too. Um, but as much as you read, that has to be tempered with actually getting in and working with the material and the realities of it. And sometimes screwing up because when you screw up, you actually sometimes come to understand, oh, <laughs> that's why they made a big deal of this in the book. Um, lessons you can only learn by doing. Um, different brains work differently there, but for me, I definitely need to have a lot of practice. Um, so I try to keep that in mind as I'm working through this and get very frustrated sometimes. Um, the other thing that, uh, since the last video, I was at the Port Townsend in Washington State in the United States. Um, that's a historic uh, sailing community and they have the Wooden Boat Festival there uh, every year, plus or minus COVID. And I think this is the first year after several years of not. And it was a wonderful thing. I went up there and uh, actually went to one of Lynn Pardee's uh, uh, workshops there and uh, just got, was able to do a lot of things, some, uh, some classes or little sessions, you know, just the introductions to like surveying wooden boats, you know, so you understand what's involved there, um, you know, bits about surveying sails, getting an idea for you know, when your sails are worn out, um, you know, some basic sail maintenance and repair workshops with the Artful Sailor and like uh, grommet making rope grommet making uh, things that I've touched a little bit on with making a ditty bag and working through Emiliano's book um, uh, about sail making but uh, you know, things are good to see and learn a lot of potential opportunities there for me in the future um, I'm looking at probably uh, getting my merchant mariner credentials again um, I used to drive research ships which is very different than sailing um, as a bridge officer and uh, at the time I was basically military and so I didn't have to have regular merchant mariner credentials or a license for that. Um, did some basic training at Merchant Marine Academy um, but not the normal cadet program there that was special with the branch of the service I was in at the time. And so you know once upon a time I had you know, credentials, a basic uh, ordinary sailor um, Euler, you know, the entry credentials, but those are long expired. Um, so working on the long process of going through getting a TWIC, uh, which is this uh, access card you need in the United States, um, getting records of my sea time so it can be applied towards the time requirements for uh, an able-bodied seaman's credentials, AB, um, and also towards eventually a master's license. Um, but that means I need to get a lot more current time on boats. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, it's something that I'd like to do personally, 
just to kind of go full circle, I used to drive large ships. Um, it'd be nice to actually have the civilian credentials to go along with that, even if they're for you know, something like a 50 or 100 ton master's license. Um, but I should have over half the sea time for that, and so uh, for a near coastal master's license. But I'm still working through the, uh, the lessons there, um, or <laughs> through the uh, learning what I need there. Um, other things at Fort Townsend uh, at the Wooden Boat Festival, there's a spider here, uh, was able to get two books signed by the authors. Um, I like books that are signed by the authors and especially appreciated the uh, Wooden Boat Festival because I was able to meet, for example, this is one by Alex Zimmerman, Becoming Coastal. Uh, he gave a talk there and it's really neat to meet the people behind the books because you're reminded that these are very real human people. Um, I provided some minor <laughs> IT support to like Lynn Pardee during our workshop. Um, and you get to realize these are real human people, um, very much like you and me, who are doing these things. And the main difference is in one way or another, they did them, and I have not yet. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of interesting ways to get where they've gotten. Um, you know, Alex's book, Becoming Coastal, was part of the inspiration to build Paradox for me. It wasn't the sole one, but you know, learning about all the places here in Puget Sound and up through the islands in the BC coast, up in Canada, um, all the adventures he had really woke me up to how much there is I can do in my own backyard here without even you know, casting off you know, to oceans or anything yet. Um, so it's really neat to see these people and realize, oh, <laughs> uh, this is something I could do too. I just have to do it. Um, this is a very good festival. Met some friends I already had, some uh, new friends, and got to do quite a lot there. Um, there's also a lot of little sessions um, that were very useful there. Um, getting back to the paradox. This is bulkhead number two with part of the vent truck installed. It is n not cleaned up yet, so there's a lot of epoxy and sanding to be done here. But it is bloody sturdy. As the, uh, the bulkheads come together, I'm getting an appreciation for just how tank-like this boat might be. Um, I was kind of worried about how flimsy this might be at first. And uh, th that those concerns are being alleviated rather quickly. Um, last time I was discussing, you know, what size drain I'd put in here. Uh, the biggest issue being it specified a one inch drain and uh, at least here in the United States, uh, PVC pipe, like I believe was the intention, uh, is uh, specified by the inner diameter. And uh, so at one inch ID pipe is something, you know, well over inch and a quarter OD outer diameter. And when I mocked that up, that was huge and would have uh, really obliterated a lot of material here. And so I went looking and uh, uh, Bill's Paradox Faith, I believe he used half inch ID pipe, uh, PVC pipe for his. And after mocking that up, that seemed to be the most practical size for me to use here. It stays completely outside of the mass step area and is still a pretty decent uh, pretty decent size um, and also I think I used this drill bit which I believe is 7 eighths yeah 7 eighths uh, you know, kind of long spade bit in order to go through and drill that through uh, used a power drill with uh, you know, actually wired to the wall not a cordless drill and was able to actually let the drill rest right on this cleat here um, to just guide that through at the perfect angle and it just went through real nice. Back of the drill there, side of the drill against the cleat, nice clean hole. Uh, test fit uh, PVC through there, looks good, um, but I won't epoxy that in until I have the bottom on because then I'll, um, I'll drill through the bottom as well and then epoxy everything in place once the bottom's on. Uh, still thinking I might clean this up and put a temporary side or a partial side panel with cutouts here. Um, I uh, you know, can do something fancy, either cut out you know, plates to go over that with some threaded inserts of some type uh, for easy access. You know, with basically most of your lines running through here, I think it makes a lot of sense to uh, 
you know, to have easy access, you know, possibly with some type of thumb screw or a similar fitting to just take those panels off to adjust, you know, blocks, pulleys, um, and uh, things in here. So I think I'll probably still go ahead with that. Might even get fancy and uh, use a laser cutter <laughs> for some of the detail work. Get my uh, fancy inlay work with a CAD. <laughs> um, but this is the next steps here are possibly that side and then just a lot of sanding to clean things up. The main thing I've been working on that's taking me so bloody long is um, the cleat and piece for the transom here. And so it's this big curve here is the cleat, which is angled. And I forget off the top of my head what that angle is. You can look it up on the plans. Um, I believe and it's also in Don Elliott's uh, Guide to Building Paradox here. At first, I thought I would just take a piece of, you know, uh, just a piece of wood that I cut at that angle and just bend it here, and that did not work. Um, it's too severe. Um, I should probably start with, you know, how I even determined that angle there. Um, as you look at the plans, here it is, it's a 35 degree bevel at the bottom. As you look at the plans, the transom here is only a half drawing. Um, at one point they were sending out physical plans and trying to save space. Um, but you can see that cleat goes along this dashed curve here, um, you know, 165 millimeters up from the baseline at the bottom here, and then an extra 160 millimeters, um, you know, is the curvature there out to the sides. It's not a circular curve, it's an interesting kind of curve. And so there's a couple ways to kind of freehand that. In the Builder's Guide, uh, Don Elliott talks about um, a way to kind of do that with moving the center point of you know a radius that you're using string for. Um, I at first tried to use a batten for it, but my battens were breaking, just because by the time I had something flexible for that, flexible enough to make that curve across the whole transom, um, it was fragile enough that it would just snap. Um, so I actually had a lot of difficulty with that. It was actually uh, my partner; she's an engineer as well. <laughs> Um, you know, suggested just doing a half width um, pattern in cardboard and you know, putting some nails down, you know, basically kind of lofting the curve around those nails and uh, using that for both sides. And that worked well. It gave me a pretty nice smooth shape that looks like it reasonably reproduced what's you know, in the plans and was able to draw it pretty well. So just that cardboard half width uh, pattern there. And so ultimately I needed uh, basically one inch thick, 25 millimeter thick um, in material to cut this out of with a bevel. And when I you know, tried cutting you know, just a small piece of, of lumber for that and bending it, it just always broke, which my battens should have kind of given that away to me. So what I really needed to do, and I think what Don Elliott describes in his section um, was, you know, I really needed a piece that's large enough to cut this directly out of like a large wide piece that's you know one inch 25 millimeters thick you know by about a little more than 160 millimeters wide and I didn't actually have a lot of you know uh, five quarter stock uh, of that width here that I wanted to do that on and so what I ended up doing was laminating I had some uh, half inch uh, you know like 12 millimeter plywood that was you know big enough and so I just laminated that together with epoxy let it dry and so I had this big piece of plywood that I was able to cut this out of with the uh, with the bevel as well uh, problems I've run into is you know the tip of that bevel is very fragile <laughs> and so I kind of you know just working with it has definitely chipped that a lot um, but of course we're working with epoxy here so everything you know epoxy is stronger than the wood itself so um, as the baffle gets added to this cleat, um, you know, basically just be epoxying in those areas so that the water runs freely, freely into what will be the tiller hole. Um, 
and take care of those imperfections in the cleat. Um, this is definitely one of those places where it is a lot of practice to learn what works in my case and what doesn't work in my case. Um, yeah, so I've, I've found something that works, but it's definitely not quite what, you know, what worked for Don Elliott in the Builder's Guide. Um, as far as actually making the baffle itself, I tried and tried and tried several ways of getting this shape. Um, I started with cardboard, like from a large, you know, delivery box, and started, you know, cutting away at it. But, uh, the folds in it made it impractical, and it was too thick a material to easily cut and shape, and it just was a nightmare, so that didn't work so well. Then I tried to get just a flat poster board, and the problem was I couldn't get it in widths wide enough, at least locally. Uh, they'd only give it, go up to 28 inches wide, and this is a little bit bigger than that, especially when you add the geometry there. Um, so what I ended up doing was, uh, getting some of this foam poster board. Uh, you might have used this if there was a science fair in your school or something like that. Um, but just white foam board from an office supply store near me. Uh, pretty cheap for a lot of it, so I could mess up a lot. But ultimately, was able to just use um, uh, some heavy duty scissors and uh, you know, just, a, just like a box cutter of a folding box cutter that worked wonderfully for this. And so I was able to basically eventually just wrap this around here and you know, tack it in place with just a little uh, a, a staple gun with some brads and you know, slowly work this around to the shape I needed. Uh, that included sometimes patching it up with scraps that I had, um, but eventually got this. Um, I'll leave a little pause here because I'll try to add in some pictures and editing that I took just of the tools I used in that process, um, showing how it comes together. So I'll add those here. And uh, once I had this, I went straight to my quarter inch uh, plywood to try to cut some, uh, some examples of it. And that did not go well. The quarter inch plywood I have does not take that curve. Um, in fact, this one I think has some marks uh, from where it started to break when I tried to force around that curve. Now there's a couple laminations in this. There's three laminations in this quarter inch that I have here. And there is a grain kind of to the outer laminations here that I can see easily. And so I did experiment with a smaller piece that had the grain oriented more favorably. And in the building guide, Don Elliott does talk about that. But even you know a, a smaller piece with the grain oriented favorably, I could not take the, the curve I need with that without it you know really starting to bust. Your mileage may vary there. Um, but this did not work. Um, I even tried a little piece of 3 16 plywood. It was, wasn't too expensive, but that's not going in the boat because it also was not working. However, what these did do was, you know, <laughs> give me a nice smoother curve to trace off of and still have close to the original shape. Um, but finally, Finally, I got 2.7 millimeter plywood, so this is roughly an eighth of an inch, uh, and this does wonderfully. It takes the curve, it's very flexible, it is a little weak. So my thoughts here are, you know, this will get assembled, and that's not too much to fiberglass. I'll probably just reinforce this with fiberglass cloth to give it some strength and durability, um, especially because this is significantly thinner than what was specified, but uh, I think that is a way that I could definitely strengthen this and strengthen up the connection there. But uh, this was, uh, I'd almost say embarrassingly difficult to make, but the reality is it 
it, it takes some thought, some practice, and uh, some trial and error. But at the end of the day, I do have parts that'll work for it. Uh, this, I believe, actually goes on later, but the time to uh, make it is right now. So I'm getting to the point where I think the next steps are um, basically doing a lot of cleanup work on the bulkheads, uh, making sure you know any little nicks or holes are patched, and uh, you know cleaning up a lot of the the drips that I haven't yet learned to use the uh, epoxy stick um, to grab. Uh, one of the suggestions in the builder's guide is you know getting a, a somewhat wide stick that you've cut a bevel on so you can use it to uh, scoop up the uh, little berm of epoxy you get as you start to fill it. Um, so I'm hoping to employ that to better effect in the future here. Um, also looking at what it might take to make some of the filleting tools that Don talks about. I've largely used the rounded sticks. Um, at first I got a fancy set of sticks from uh, Duckworks and uh, they're just CNC'd out and they're rounded radiuses that you can use for uh, the fillet work. Um, but then I realized the popsicle sticks that I use to uh, uh, to mix the stuff can work as well. Um, but it doesn't quite give you that perfect behavior that a rounded thing like a marble will use. If you use a marble to do your filleting work, no matter what angle you hold it at, it's going to be you know, basically the same curve that it's creating. And that can work well in the corners, it looks like. Um, but you know, the popsicle sticks are similar things, you know, depending on the angle, you know, it'll change how the fillet actually comes out. And I'm not building a clock or a piano, thankfully, <laughs> um, building a very sturdy boat. Um, but I think that's another area I can focus on and improve. Um, just need to buy some marbles. Um, uh, but yeah, aside from, you know, kind of cleaning these up, uh, doing some sanding to get them into shape, starting to look at bringing the, uh, the cleats into the angle um, that I'll need. Uh, I think kind of the next steps are you know, really, I think I want to epoxy seal the faces of these bulkheads um, because it's easier to do it now than when they're in the boat and I can do that on a flat surface and control runs and coating better um, just to get a nice good coverage on that. And then I think it's work moving towards a dry fit up. And you know, from that dry fit up, I can really determine what angle, you know, the outboard cleats and you know, the bottom cleats a little bit, but mostly the outboard cleats need to take as I move forward there. Um, I'm looking at going back to work soon um, and would like to kind of gone 3D with the boat before I'm back working. So uh, kind of working towards that milestone is the next big thing. Trying to think if there's any other things to bring up here. Um, yes, there is. It's a small thing, but I mentioned it earlier. This is the afterface of bulkhead number one. And if you look at the forward face of bulkhead number two, for uh, blockers extending forward of bulkhead number two to the back of bulkhead number one. But in the plans, the location of these cleats really isn't clear. And so they're definitely intended to be there, but it looks like it's kind of a little bit up to you, and these are not going to be at right angles, uh, especially because they're offset, and there's only so much space up here. So I've put in some cleats, um, basically so that I can kind of lead those uh, those locker side panels up forward um, myself. They're not going to be perfectly square. I don't think that's the intention, but uh, I kind of guesstimated where they went and went for kind of the maximum uh, width there. Uh, I did make sure also that they're clear of the hatch I'm using. I'm just using a pre-bought uh, you know, ceiling hatch to hopefully keep the forward section watertight but accessible. And so I drew out the extents of that. And it's a small thing, but one of the points I was looking at is I think I want the closure mechanism to be up here and the hinges at the bottom. So that as I'm trying to do stuff 
through <laughs> with my body through this uh, this space, reaching up here to reach all the way forward. Um, I want the hatch to drop down when I open it so that I'm not having to hold it up with one hand while holding a flashlight or a tap light or something and doing whatever I'm doing in the forward compartment there. So uh, just a hatch that drops down. So here's what that looks like. Pretty decent hatch, not horribly expensive. You could do something simpler. I've seen, you know, on uh, on other builds, uh, other Matt's builds, it looks like they just use a five gallon pail and the uh, the lid that goes along with the five gallon pail to provide a nice watertight seal. Um, in the future, I might consider that if I'm looking for a thrifty option. This should be pretty good. Yeah, so for that. The final note I have is uh, just literally, uh, well not bookkeeping, but shopkeeping. Uh, the problem I definitely run into that I think everyone runs into is uh, frustration builds a lot more quickly when things aren't put away, and that's only myself to blame. But I've come to recognize and appreciate the importance of putting all of the tools away at the end of the day. It sounds bloody simple and obvious, but it's not, um, especially in a small space like this, um, especially when you know, it's easy to put stuff you know, just on this frame and then I don't have to drag the frame out into you know, the, the driveway every day. The reality is I just need to drag the frame out into the driveway any day I'm working on the boat. And then I can easily walk around to the, the toolbox, you know, to the different to the clamps, to where all everything is, and just put things away. Um, it's a little hurdle, you know, sometimes there's three cars that park out in front of here, depending on the time of the day or who's here. Um, you know, I might have to ask someone to move or whatnot, and sometimes you just think, oh, I'll just knock the simple thing out. But uh, I think the simple lesson that I've learned that's important is roll the whole thing out whenever I'm going to work on it and make that happen. And then put everything away at the end of the day. Simple, but it makes a big difference. That's all I've got for today. Take care.